So what I'm going to do uh, today is uh, give a little bit of history um, about uh, well the use of statistics and data in uh, in pandemic uh, situations. Uh, then I'm going to talk a lot about statistics, of course, uh, no formulas. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, a scandal uh, to spice it up a bit and. Um, well, I was asked to give some future perspectives also because this is the last lecture. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, so going back, um, using statistics in pandemics is not something new. Uh, here you see the Bill of Mortality, uh, which was published in 1664. Um, and it, it lists causes of death uh, during uh, the plague. You can see things from uh, a stopping of the stomach to fever or killed accidentally with a carbine as uh, causes of death. And this was actually uh, done by uh, Paris clerks in London. So what they did was they made this paper uh, with these mortality figures for the 130 parishes that were at that time in London, uh, listing all these various, various uh, causes of death. Uh, and it was also lucrative. So they, it brought some money for, for the church. Um, but besides it being interesting, uh, it's of course one of the first, probably the first, early warning systems for disease outbreaks. And that makes it very interesting. So Forward, 150 years later, we uh, meet Florence Nightingale. And Florence Nightingale was uh, a nurse, but uh, foremost a famous statistician. Because she's the creator of this, which is called the uh, Oxcomb diagram. I had to look it up. Um, and this is probably one of the first uh, data visualizations ever uh, produced that was so very clear. It um, probably uh, wouldn't uh, be wrong to, uh, to see this kind of visualizations in articles today. And what is interesting, this is, this is data during the uh, Crimea war, uh, and it shows the, the cause of death. And uh, what you can see is that actually poor hygiene, which is the blue, uh, was much more important than bullets. So causes of death during the war in the army were primarily due to, to poor hygiene. This is what she, she uh, showed. Um, at the same time, uh, we have Jon Snow. And if I say Jon Snow, most of you will think about uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, but of course, I'm talking about the right Jon Snow, the 1800s Jon Snow. Uh, it's the guy on the right. Uh, and he is actually the founding father of uh, what we now call epidemiology, or at least he's, that's how he is uh, perceived. And he became famous for this, uh, which was um, a pump, a water pump. Uh, and actually he traced a cholera outbreak in London, uh, in the neighborhood of Soho, back to this pump. And now, of course, it's a, a tourist attraction uh, rather than a, a real water pump. You can still uh, find it. And what he did, he was, he actually made a, a very nice map, a very famous map. And if you zoom in a little, what you can see is that around Broad, Broad Street, that's where the pump is located, uh, you can see uh, the highest numbers of death very close to the pump. So if you have some modern interpretation of that, uh, it looks like this. And you can see the other pumps, uh, the black with the golden circle in it. You can clearly see, uh, well, good evidence that this one pump is indeed uh, the source, which is again, something uh, with, we're talking about uh, 200 years ago, uh, something very uh, innovative. So this very short history lesson, which is, uh, I'm not a historian, I'm a statistician, um, is nothing new uh, about the use of data and statistics to prevent, understand, and forecast communicable diseases, uh, diseases that spread. 
Um, and then, of course, well, we all know we, we've all been affected. We're still affected by it. Came the coronavirus. Uh, and just a, a little uh, update uh, or a, a little timeline just to, to uh, make you remember. Uh, it all started in, uh, at, at least for, for us Europeans, it started probably at the 31st of December uh, in, in, in last year when the WHO reported a cluster of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan, China. It took another two weeks before it, uh, it, it hit Thailand, uh, another two weeks to hit Italy. We all know what happened to Italy afterwards. Um, and it took uh, almost a month until the first confirmed case uh, in the Netherlands, and then another two weeks for the intelligent lockdown, how they call it, in the Netherlands. And uh, at the same day, the WHO to announce that this COVID 19 that's the disease uh, outbreak uh, was a real uh, pandemic. And it took some more weeks to get 1 million confirmed cases. I will later talk about this, uh, the 29th of, uh, of April, um, where actually the first randomized trial was, uh, was shown. Uh, and uh, well, we now uh, hit almost 6 million cases. So that's the, the short timeline for now. And of course, uh, statistics are, uh, are everywhere, um, whether you like it or not. Uh, you get daily updates uh, in the national news. Uh, this was of, of, of Saturday, I think, and 96 uh, corona patients, six deaths, three uh, hospitalizations. There's no way to get around that. And if you look at the RVM uh, website, you can get a lot of extra data, a lot of graphs. Uh, and this is something uh, that might be interesting uh, to you. Uh, and of course, what we see is here is the, the number of newly admitted patients. Uh, and we see that, uh, well, the, the peak was somewhere in, in, uh, in March. Uh, and that, well, became a lot less until now almost no new patients uh, are admitted in the hospital these days. So these are of course all data or all statistics uh, that you can find on the RVM website. Uh, and I'm sure uh, other people have shown you this or you've, you've probably all seen this uh, very nice uh, um, website by Johns Hopkins University that shows a lot of the key figures uh, about, the, uh, about the coronavirus. We're now at 6.8 million uh, confirmed cases, about 400,000 uh, deaths or confirmed deaths uh, due to COVID. Um, and this is a, a website that I think uh, did uh, in this corona crisis a very good job in uh, in uh, depicting statistics and it was the financial times and what you see here it's very nice overview of the axis of death which they estimate um, and here we see uh, in the in the bottom left corner we see the netherlands we're almost around now uh, the level uh, that we don't have any more axis of death well, in Peru, uh, they, they still have uh, a very large axis of death. And of course, um, the statistics that I show you are actually public health statistics. Um, and those public health statistics uh, are, are used to monitor uh, disease outbreaks. Uh, and one of the uh, one of the things uh, people do with this statistics is to build transition models to see how the disease spread. Also to identify sources of outbreaks, the super spreading events, such as uh, uh, in our country, uh, probably um, uh, the, uh, the, the, south, the southern of the Netherlands uh, was, uh, had a super spreading event. And there's also contract, sorry, contact tracing uh, that is done. Uh, 
other reasons to do this type of uh, data analysis. Sorry, my computer is doing acting up weird, right? So um, other other reasons is the monitoring of hospitalizations and the IACU admissions, monitoring fatalities, uh, such as the case fatality rate, which is number of deaths divided by the confirmed number of cases. Uh, although you might argue that the infection fatality rate, which is the number of deaths divided by actual infections, is more interesting. But typically, we, it's, it's easier, of course, to estimate the case fatality rate. And uh, last but not least, uh, monitoring uh, transition strategies. So the strategies that are uh, being put in place uh, for the lockdown, for example, and see how, how they affect uh, the spread of the disease. Um, of course, this public health data during a pandemic is, of course, for uh, the reason of public health. Uh, and it's also the main focus of media and, and public attention. And it's, it's super highly centralized. It's on national level, we have the RITM and the GGD and the outbreak management team, uh, which all uh, monitor this or, or, uh, or, or even organize this uh, collection of data and also the analysis. Um, and one of the characteristics is that it's, it's extremely fast. So you get updates from the RVM every day. And one of the benefits they have is that they have a very good uh, data infrastructure. Now, of course, we can say, we can have discussions about whether all the data is very accurate. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, later. But, uh, of course, these, uh, I, I like this picture because uh, this, is, this is what I picture mentally when I think about coronavirus. It's the people in the hospital. And the data that I just showed are not so extremely relevant for people that are in the hospital. People in the hospital and medical doctors uh, have other questions. They have questions about how to diagnose diseases, why people have, uh, why some uh, patients have uh, blood clots uh, and, and others uh, do not. Uh, we're interested, of course, in, in understanding who dies and who doesn't die to prevent dying. And uh, we're interested, interested in um, understanding and, and finding therapies that work for people that actually have COVID. And if you have a background in epidemiology, you will recognize this as diagnostic questions uh, and etiology questions, so questions about cause and effect, prognosis questions, so what happens to the patient, uh, and uh, therapy patients, what happens to the patient if I intervene. Um, which is called in epidemiology, it's called the DEP model. So diagnosis, etiology, prognosis, and therapy. And just to give you a few examples of the questions that we still have. Uh, for example, what is the negative predictive value of uh, some diagnostic tests in individuals with flu-like uh, symptoms? Uh, a negative predictive value means the probability that somebody who is, has a negative result on this uh, test actually doesn't have COVID. That's a diagnostic question that we still uh, are still waiting for the answer. Other question, uh, which is more cause and effect, is well, what is the causal mechanism behind pulmonary embolisms we see in, in some of the COVID patients and, and not in others. Uh, prognosis uh, question, uh, one example uh, that I'm working on is, is which hospitalized patients are more likely to die or to go to the ICU. Of course, if we have that kind of information, we can, we can act early and prevent hopefully death. Um, and uh, another question is, uh, well, the treatment, uh, especially both the efficacy, so whether how well it works and how safe it is uh, of the anti, uh, antiviral treatments, so, uh, such as hydrochloroquine. Now, and compared to uh, the public health data, uh, we're not directly interested in, in public health. We're interested in the suspected COVID-19 patient's health. That's also not... Uh, the main focus of, uh, of the media, maybe therapy, uh, so these antiretroviral uh, therapies are an exception. And it's not centralized. So unlike 
uh, the, uh, the data collection for the public health, uh, the data collected for understanding uh, how uh, things work with people in the hospital is not centralized. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not even centralized on a hospital level. I will come back to that later. It's also relatively slow uh, compared to, uh, to RVM data. Uh, and unfortunately, we often ha don't have existing data infrastructures that encourage collection uh, of large amounts of data uh, for scientific research. So back to the COVID timeline. There was Dr. Trump at, uh, who, who discussed or, or suggested in March, the 21st of March, that the hydro, uh, uh, hydro, <laughs> hydro, hydrochloroquine, sorry, um, would work, would probably work, would be a, the biggest game changer in the history of, uh, of medicine. Uh, and that the FDA uh, moved mountains. And of course, after this tweet and after he, he talked about this a lot, uh, a lot of people were uh, very hopeful of this uh, particular, uh, particular drug. And, um, but there was no evidence yet. But if you look at the number of publications that actually came out on the topic of uh, of, uh, of COVID, you can see an enormous rise in publications. And these are, these are enormous numbers. These are the number of publications per day. So in our peak uh, around uh, May, we, we had more than 900 publications about COVID, medical publications per day, which is huge. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have an answer to hydrochloroquine for a long time. Just, just for your reference point was when we had 1 million cases and after that the, the number, uh, well, rapidly increased. And it took until uh, a couple of weeks ago before we got the first real large study uh, into, the, um, uh, into the treatment, uh, it was published in The Lancet. Um, and that actually showed, uh, but we'll come back to that later, that uh, it, it uh, was uh, a dangerous uh, medicine. Now, um, there's a lot of complaining going on, including by me, but also uh, people that, that published about it. Uh, for example, Paul Glashew uh, pub uh, published his paper uh, in May also uh, in the BMJ. Uh, where he describes the waste in COVID-19 research, because I think a lot of people now agree that there's a lot of research going on, but they don't answer the, the right questions. And this is a quote, existing research infrastructure to enable collaboration and communication is extremely limited with system cracks made more apparent by the pace and the volume of COVID-19 research. Registries do not exist for most study types. When there is a global rush to research a disease, a centralized accessible portal hosted by the WHO, for example, of all ongoing research and synthesis would be invaluable. Of course, this is, uh, I imagine, this is something very alarming, especially for people outside of the field of medicine. Uh, practically saying that we don't have the right uh, tools to do uh, this very important uh, medical research. And it's very much the same, uh, so some evidence extra uh, came from our, our research where we did a systematic review and critical appraisal of, uh, of diagnostic and prognostic models, so part of this literature. And what we found is indeed very local, very small data sets which were generally unrepresentative. Very poor statistical modeling, very poor reporting, and all of the models we evaluated, there were 66 of them, were evaluated at a high risk of bias, which is not good, obviously. So none of these models that were 
developed to help guide uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinical work. And all of these models we would recommend for use. And I asked, I asked um, Joyce to ask you to read this paper, which was uh, written by uh, Doc Altman, who uh, died uh, two years ago, almost exactly today. And he wrote this actually in 1994. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of what, what he's saying here applies to modern COVID uh, research as well. And he says, what should we think about a doctor who uses the wrong treatment, either willfully or through ignorance, or who uses right treatment wrongfully, as given by the wrong, uh, as, such as by giving the wrong dose of a drug? Most people would agree that such behavior was unprofessional, arguably unethical, and certainly unacceptable. What then should we think about researchers who use the wrong techniques, either willfully or in ignorance, use the right techniques wrongly, misinterpret their results, report their results selectively, cite the literature selectively, and draw unjustified conclusions. We should be appalled. Yet numerous studies of the medical literature in both general and specialist journals have shown that all of the above phenomena are common. This is surely a scandal. Which are, of course, very strong words uh, in a medical journal. And he goes on when he says, when I tell friends outside of medicine that many papers published in medical journals are misleading because of methodological weakness, like we showed, they are rightly shocked. Huge sums of money are spent annually on research that's seriously flawed through the use of inappropriate designs, unrepresentative samples, like we showed, again, small samples, like we showed, incorrect methods of analysis, like we showed, uh, and faulty, in, uh, faulty interpretation. Errors are so varied that a, wall, uh, that a whole book on the topic, valuable as it is, is not comprehensive. In any case, many of those who make the errors are unlikely to read it. And the best quote is probably the, the, the best sentence a, a paper ever started with, uh, which we should all hang on our walls probably. We need less research, not more research better research and research done for the right reasons. And there was a real scandal also, because the, uh, the article that I talked about, published in Lancet, uh, has been retracted last, uh, last week, talking about a real scandal. So the reason is, is because probably these data uh, didn't even exist. And retractions are not very uncommon, unfortunately, these days. Uh, a very nice uh, website to look or to, to monitor that is Retraction Watch. And uh, at this point, there are already 17 papers on COVID-19 that have been retracted, uh, which is a very high number. So of course, now you might question, is it all this bad? Is all science uh, broken? Of course, the answer should be no. There are good things that happen too. Uh, for example, one of the uh, best things that happened was probably the whole genome sequencing of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so already the Chinese on January 12th, they, uh, they did this genotyping, uh, which has been very, very important uh, for understanding the disease. Now this, little creature that also played an important role because pretty soon on we, or, or uh, at least there was very strong evidence by a large Chinese group published in Nature uh, that the pneumonia outbreak was associated with, uh, with bats. And this is one of the drugs, uh, Remdesivir. And, um, this was one of the first papers published uh, a randomized controlled trial, double blind, placebo controlled, uh, which means uh, rigorous. Uh, and what they found in the end was that 
for this particular drug, um, remdesivir was not associated associated with statistically significant clinical benefits, meaning uh, it probably doesn't work. Although the conclusion, of course, is a bit disappointing. Uh, it's very nice to have this kind of uh, kind of research to know what kind of drugs you should give and uh, which uh, you shouldn't. Um, well, of, co of course, the problem of this, uh, again, of this, uh, of this paper is that it was published only in April 29, and it still suggests that there's, uh, there's more research uh, that has to be done before we are really sure about, uh, about this particular drug. And then there was, of course, the, the other drug that we already talked about. The good news is, uh, after the, the, the scandal of, of the Lancet of last week, there was also a, a very nice paper uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it's, again, a randomized controlled trial. And what they show is that uh, the drug doesn't prevent illness uh, in... Uh, a, a pre pretty large 821 uh, participants uh, group. Of course, there are more trials going on. A lot of trials are going on. At this point, there are more than 2,000 or almost 2,000 uh, trials registered uh, on COVID-19, which are underway. And perhaps more surprisingly, there are more than 1,000 uh, systematic reviews that have been registered and are ongoing on um, COVID-19. Now, taking a step back, uh, this is a nice paper, uh, I think, uh, published in, uh, in, in Science by, uh, by London and Kimmelman, where they argue against pandemic research exceptionalism. And they say, although crisis presents major logistical and practical challenges, the moral mission of research remains the same, to reduce uncertainty and enable caregivers, health systems, and policymakers to better address individual and public health, rather than generating permission to carry out low uh, quality investigations, the urgency and the scarcity of pandemics heighten the responsibility of key actors in research in the research enterprise to coordinate their activities to uphold the standards necessary to advance this mission saying that it's very important even though we need these uh, uh, the, the, the science very quickly during the pandemic is very important to keep in mind also the quality uh, and one of the issues of course is that doing research doing scientific research what makes it a bit different than monitoring is if you do scientific research you come into you run into a lot of methodological problems and probably one of the biggest problems in uh, the research that we see uh, on COVID-19 is what we call selection bias which is simply illustrated by this example that has nothing to do with COVID so imagine you are interested in the relationship between acting ability and attractiveness. Now, if you look at the whole population, which are the blue dots and the red dots together, there's no association. Now, if you're gonna only look at the people that are successful actors, you might suddenly see a relationship. Why? It's because uh, very, uh, it, it, actors with a low uh, attractiveness probably are very good in acting. Well, if you're more attractive, it becomes less important. So you get a negative, a negative relationship. Well, the same holds uh, for a lot of research in COVID, especially if we're only gonna look at the people that are uh, hospitalized. So we only get the most uh, successful, in a sense, uh, patients successful in the sense that they're the most diseased now, of course we can get very strange association if we don't realize the fact that we're looking at the most severe cases and there are three other 
which are very common methodological challenges. First one is confounding. Uh, and all epidemiologists that are looking at this, of course, know confounding because that's uh, their main job, uh, which means lack of comparability. So comparing patients between each other to understand how the, how the disease uh, functions is complicated by people that have, for example, comorbidities. And comorbidities means that not every patient is alike. And we have to control that for not, that not, uh, not being alike. A second problem that we often face, and especially in, uh, in COVID-19 research, is measurement error and misclassification error. So one of the examples of that is that we don't have a gold standard test uh, to diagnose uh, COVID. And I think Professor van der Weigert has discussed this uh, in an earlier lecture in this series. And the third, again, very common uh, problem in um, COVID-19 data analysis is incomplete data, because not every COVID-19 patients going to the hospital undergoes the same workup, meaning they don't get the same blood test, they don't all uh, get a CT scan, for example. So you get incomplete data uh, when you try to compare different pa patients. And of course, traditionally, and I think this, 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 should be, this should be the case, a quality of data analysis and quality of data should trump uh, the speed of uh, analysis or the speed of science. But there are initiatives, of course, to increase the speed. Uh, probably uh, a lot of you have heard about MedArchive these days, which is a preprint server. So traditionally, uh, well, uh, manuscripts of, uh, of, of, of uh, scientific research, uh, also medical research, but for all types of research, uh, are submitted to a journal who does uh, a peer review of the article and you get feedback or you're rejected and you go to a new journal. In this case, MedArchive is a preprint server uh, where you can submit your paper, which will not be uh, peer reviewed, which is also highlighted in the, in, in the red, uh, by, by the red letters here, uh, will not be peer reviewed, but it, uh, it at least speeds up the process of getting it published. And of course, this is not the only a place where you then submit your paper, but you also submit it to a journal. So it's sort of a double uh, trajectory, if you will. So this is a uh, preprint, which has, up, has grown exponentially uh, during the COVID-19 uh, era um, to get new research quicker to uh, the medical professionals. Um, on the other hand, the journals have also been uh, changing because of the pandemic. They, there have been uh, fast track peer review and editorial processes. I've been involved in one which took four days, which is lightning quick because normally it takes uh, months before your paper gets through peer review uh, and, and sometimes years before it gets published. Another way, of course, of increasing uh, speed or discussions. Um, during this COVID area were on, on the social media and on blogs. So there are initiatives indeed to speed up uh, science. Now, and something that might, uh, might be uh, unbelievable for, uh, for some people who are not in, in medical science, um, of course, we all know we now have medical records, electronic medi me medical records, um, in most hospitals, but the, uh, the strange thing maybe is that these medical records are not accessible for uh, medical research, at least not directly in the Netherlands. Of course, this is something uh, we probably should want. We want to learn from uh, uh, previous uh, patients previous COVID patients to improve our care for future patients. And one of the ideas uh, related to this is the so-called learning healthcare system. And the learning healthcare system, uh, the, the idea behind this is that you indeed learn from the cases. 
Uh, so get data, analyze that data, interpret data, get feedback to, uh, to the clinicians, change your policy, and then again, look at, look at the data. Uh, this, this is not easy because it involves many stakeholders from healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, patients, epidemiologists, statisticians, data scientists, bioinformaticians, ethicists, uh, very important, lawyers, basic scientists, data managers, and inf uh, information technologists to get such a system uh, from the ground. So this is one reason, of course, why we do not yet do that. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm going to end my uh, presentation by saying it's not that we don't try. Uh, there are now a lot of data initiatives, including ISERIC, uh, Capacity, Open Safely, COVID Predict, and COVID Precise, which are, we, which are trying to get as much data uh, as quick as possible. But of course, we're now beyond the 6 million uh, people, uh, 6 million infections. Uh, so, so probably, we, in, at least in, in future pandemics, we should act a bit faster. So this was uh, my talk.